It's the 119th element in the periodic table, and no one up to this point has been able to isolate it for any long period of time. We know it's possible. We know it's there, but it's the next big thing. Just like Andrew's company, the next big thing. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. I'm really excited to talk to Mark Sullivan today, Chief Operating Officer of Element 119. Mark, thanks so much for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. It's the Made in America podcast, Mark. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, we make ceramic coatings for the automotive, uh, the marine, and aerospace industries. And why do we do it? That's actually a moving target. Um, I got to be honest with you, when the owner started the company, um, he did it because he thought it was a way to get out of the rat race. Now we have a different way of looking at things. We have essentially, over the last four years, been able to create um, a, a win-win situation for small businesses. We've built up approximately 3,000 small businesses across America just over the last four years. That's our new goal. That's why we're doing this. We're, we're trying to help people. We're lifting people that used to just do auto detailing and live in semi-poverty to buy in their own place, buy in their own house, buy in their own car, that type of stuff. That's really terrific, Mark. And I think we've got a lot to talk about there because mm -hmm. the really interesting for me sort of Connecticut connection on all this, right, is the real, real impetus from my understanding was sort of a Sikorsky connection. And so what started off as a little bit of aerospace and defense turns into building up 3,000 small businesses and small business leaders with, I know, thousands more to come, tons of innovation. So, I mean, it's a really cool sort of Connecticut story, right? It's got, it's got a little bit of helicopter, a little bit of defense, a little bit of innovation, some chemistry, some IP, um, some ingenuity, you know, some Yankee stick to uh, and some real growth. So, I mean, it's a really, really cool uh, story. And I'm excited to get in to all of it, including the future and what's coming next and, and what you guys see down the road. But before we get to all that, I'd love to talk about you and sort of your background and sort of what, how you got to this place, because that's a pretty cool, long, winding road story uh, as well. So maybe share with the audience, you know, what's your background, Mark, and, you know, how'd you get into the chemical manufacturing business? Well, I'm my story of my life is a story of half and half. <laughs> I spent half of my life in Massachusetts, where I grew up in the Springfield area, actually West Springfield. Um, and then after graduating college with a degree in chemical engineering from WPI, Worcester Polytech in Worcester, I worked for a few years for a big chemical manufacturing company in Quincy, Massachusetts. And one day I just kind of looked around. I was in my early 20s. I saw my boss and I thought, I'm not sure I want to be that guy in five years. And I looked at his boss and I said, I definitely don't want to be that guy in 10 years. And I, I got in my car and I just started driving around the United States. Uh, I drove through 41 different states in approximately two months. One of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my entire life up to that point was Colorado. So after doing a West Coast tour, going all, driving all the way from Oregon all the way down to Manhattan Beach uh, along the Pacific, uh, Pacific Coast Highway, I basically decided to go back to Colorado uh, and then I lived there for the next 26 years. So No job, no prospects, just a beautiful mountain view and a dream. Exactly. You nailed it. And uh, it's funny, my first job, ski. Uh, I was a ski bum. <laughs> I think that's got to be one of the top two jobs in uh, Colorado. Uh, you know what? I'm in my mid-50s now. I wish I was young enough to go back and do it again. What mountain would you uh, ski bum at? Uh, my favorite mountain in Colorado is Beaver Creek. Um it's not connected to Vail, but there's a bus that goes between the two of them. Most people that came out to visit me wanted to go to Vail. I do that all day long. You can't ski the whole mountain in one day. It's absolutely enormous, especially ever since they opened up Blue Sky Basin in the back. Um, but Beaver Creek has the best little, I mean, they're, they're, there's just these little tiny trails that nobody knows about. Um, you go down them, and there's nobody there. Uh, there's some natural half pipes that were absolutely incredible. And 
that's my favorite mountain. It's just, if you know where to go, it's a great place. So what got you out of the ski bum life, man? It sounds, the way you're describing it, the look in your eye, the tone in your voice, it sounds idyllic. I'm like, why aren't you still there? <laughs> you know what? At some point, uh, I looked at myself and I said, all right, I spent a year being a ski bum and I was supposed to go back to school. I had gotten into three different colleges. I had chosen the University of Colorado for to get my master's degree and I wasn't ready to go back yet. So I called him up and I said, can I put this off for a year? And I was a ski bum for another year. <laughs> and then I finally went back. I decided I got to I gotta get on with life. I was then in my mid-20s, um, went and got my master's degree at University of Colorado. And when I graduated, the funniest thing is my first job, they sent me to Hartford, Connecticut. I know. That. Almost right back home. <laughs> yeah, I was in the gold building downtown uh, Hartford for uh, a little over a year. And then they transferred me all places to the Denver office. So I just kept bouncing back and forth. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, and so what were you what were you doing that brought you back? And, and what was that company that you were working for that had you kind of doing that? Was it consulting? It was. Uh, so at the time, it was called Anderson Consulting. They were a spinoff of um, Arthur Anderson. They now go by the name of Accenture. Mm -hmm. um, they're a very big business and IT consulting firm. I was doing the, the tech side for them. Uh, I was, I'm going to date myself here by saying this, but we were taking mainframes and converting entire organizations over to client server, which just means there's, there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's no longer a mainframe that you, and a dumb terminal in front of you. You actually have a computer that's somewhat intelligent in front of you. Yeah, the percentage of people listening to this that remember the green screen dumb terminals is going to be yep. pretty low, Mark. Uh, you, you and I are in, in a very small company there. So what happens after that? So you're doing consulting, traveling around doing that, and then what? And then uh, the dot-com bust came. Um, Accenture, over a very short period of time, went from, I believe, 75,000 people worldwide down to about I think it was 12,500. I could have the numbers wrong, but they're in the right category. Um, and there were seven rounds of layoffs. I remember this because friends were dropping left and right. I got taken down by the very last, the seventh round. And I remember the exact date because I was sitting in my home. Um, I got a phone call saying, can you please come to the, the Denver office to meet the uh, managing partner of the office? And I knew it was about being laid off. And I told them, no, I'm not going to any city center today because it is 9-11-01. And if you turn on your TV, you're going to see planes flying into buildings. So I got laid off on 9-11. So, well, listen, it's better than being on one of the planes, I suppose, yeah. but uh, still tough stuff. But so, I didn't have to go into the office, though. I got laid yeah, off remotely? Over, a, over a fax machine. Oh, they, yeah, they faxed you? <laughs> yeah. Also dating yourself. So then, so, so now you're out of Accenture. What's going on now? What, what's what's Kevin thinking? What's uh, Mark thinking about? Well, uh, I decided I wanted to do some interesting stuff, so I tried to go back to my, my graduate degree. My master's degree is in environmental engineering and engineering management. I decided I wanted to give it a try. So I started up a environmental engineering company, ran that for about 10 years, ended up selling that. Um, I think I'm still under a non-disclosure, so I can't tell you who I sold it to. It's like 10 years ago, probably mm -hmm. not, but I won't like mention environmental it. engineering, like phase one, phase two, groundwater remediation, stuff like that? We were doing a little bit different stuff. We were doing groundwater modeling. So there would be contaminant plumes, and we would figure out which way the plume would go based on the structure of the uh, ground rock and the lay of the land. Because sometimes, and people that, that drill wells know this, just because the, the surface of the land slants in one direction doesn't mean the rock slants in that direction. It could be going in a completely different direction. Um, so it was a very niche business. Um, I ended up selling to, you know, another company um, who will remain nameless. Uh, but that kind of left me without anything to do. And a friend of mine, uh, an acquaintance, was starting up his own business, needed somebody to step in. So I was employee number one at a place called Forsyth Advisors out of uh, St. Louis. Okay. And um, among other things, I worked for them for about a decade. Um, I'd gone as far as I could with them. Uh, 
very w- wonderful, wonderful place to work. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Um, and then this opportunity in Connecticut came along right around the time that I was thinking that I had done everything I could with Forsyth. Um, Andrew Seppa, who's the owner of Element 119, uh, found me through Indeed, like you find a lot of people. <laughs> um, and after literally a 15-minute phone call, I'm in Denver, he's in Connecticut, 15-minute phone call, I said, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going to come meet you. And the rest is pretty much history. And that was, what, two and a half years ago now? Um, yeah, just a little just a little over two years now. Wow. So how long after uh, that flight to Connecticut did you pack up from uh, Denver and move back here? Uh, it took me about two months. Uh, <laughs> I think he wanted me out here a little quicker than that. But I had some, you know, loose ends that I had to figure out. Um, and I just threw everything that I needed in my car, which is surprisingly not that much. <laughs> uh, drove across the country and got here on a Friday and started work on a Monday. There you go. Right back. That's a that's a, a long winding trail from uh, from West West Springfield all the way down to Manhattan Beach over to St. Louis and right back to right back to the well, not, maybe not West Springfield, but close enough. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Element 119. I think the first sort of question is, why Element 119? Why not? Why that name? So I asked the same question. Uh, I looked it up before my job interview. Uh, it's un- 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 um I'm probably saying it. I'm probably butchering it. I've never actually heard it spoken. Uh, but it's the 119th element in the periodic table, and no one up to this point has been able to isolate it for any long period of time. We know it's possible. We know it's there, but it's the next big thing. Just like Andrew's company, the next big thing. There you go. That's awesome. It's a great story. And I think it's a really, really creative name because the name of the element itself is unusable, right? You can't, that's not a good name, but, uh, but element 119 uh, is pretty awesome. And I think the the Genesis sort of the the first company that that Element 119 sold to, and I know the the product's called System X. Um, and, and listen, I don't want to tell the story. So so why don't you sort of tell it? You know, Andrew sort of starts this this thing. Why? What was the problem he was looking to solve, and and how did we bring it? How did we solve that? So um, I'll back up just a little bit. Andrew was working as a consultant. Um, he he could see the writing on the wall. His the company he was working for is no longer around. Um, I think he knew that was happening, so he was looking for kind of his next gig. Didn't mind the idea of working for himself. He saw an open call from Sikorsky where they were having some problem with um, behind the exhaust port of one of their helicopters, they had a coking problem. That's a buildup of a what carbon. Uh, coking. Coking, okay. Right, just buildup of carbon, you know, black soot basically on the fuselage of the uh, of the vehicle, of the helicopter. All they wanted was some sort of coating they could put on there, make it easier to clean. Andrew, among other companies, um, submitted a product. Andrew is a he's a material scientist and a chemist, uh, very very good at what he does. Submitted the product. They said we love it. We're going to use it. We're going to buy it from you. One caveat: you can't sell it to anyone else. <laughs> and at that point, he thought, "Oh well, this is great. I can do this. Okay, I'll just sell to them." And that was good for a couple of years. And then I think he thought, you know what? I'm a car guy. Maybe I can do the same thing for automobiles. And around that time, ceramics were starting to take off a little bit. There were some big players in the, in the industry. Um, very, very good marketing companies. So Andrew did not have to reinvent the entire market. He didn't have to come in and say, you need a ceramic coat on your car because of X. There were already companies out there doing that. All Andrew had to do was just make the best product in the market, and that's what he did. And honestly, not just my opinion, it's really not even that close. That's pretty amazing. And I, I think, I mean, and, and I, neither of us are, uh, are well, I guess you you have some chemical engineering background, so you could speak to it way more than I can. I'm going to ask you um, some questions. But I think that's just so cool, and, I, and my understanding is he was just like in his mid to late 20s when this whole thing got off the ground, which is amazing. That is absolutely true. And that's, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago to him, but it really is only, you know, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years now. 
That's, that's unbelievable. Sometimes you just got to be maybe like a little bit naive to just give it a shot and try to try it. You know what I mean? Uh, before you think that you can't and this amazing things can happen. So are you guys still to the whole thing? If I can go back to the Sikorsky, the coking problem. So basically what you're saying is the, the paint's getting all messed up from the exhaust. And no matter what they put on it, it just won't get unmessed up. That's about right. Um, and the more um, particulate matter you get on, on a coating... Um, typically, helicopters have have some sort of coating on them. It might just be a polyurethane coating um, that's easily broken down by uh, some pretty tough acids, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you have coking, it's really just inviting other contaminants to then stick with it. Um, one of the wonderful things about carbon is it has activation sites and it draws things in. That's why when I used to work for Procter & Gamble, um, we had activated carbon filters mm -hmm. where we would run our effluent stream through it and all the yucky stuff would stick to the carbon. So the water that came out, we could then send it out to Anybody the Anybody who's sewer. ever had a Brita filter, right? That's the activated carbon in there to keep your water clean. And that's why you're, that's why it's such a great thing for filtering water, right? Nailed it. That's exactly, exactly right. So it wasn't just that it was carbon. It was that it was somewhat activated carbon uh, because it was spent fuel. And things would stick to it. So all they wanted to do was just make sure it was easy to clean it off just so that it didn't cause problems down the road. Because just if I could fill that out. So if, I'm, so if I'm getting this coking with activated carbon on panels of my helicopter, which is ostensibly at the exhaust where the engine is, somewhat near the blade, if I'm not mistaken, for where that exhaust is, and then that's going to bind with other things, I'm just inviting additional helicopter failure extra maintenance. A lot of these helicopters, of course, makes for the military are probably run in adverse conditions. What you don't want is your Black Hawk on the way back from the Osama bin Laden raid going down because we've got coking problems on the on the panels and stuff like that. Absolutely. You're throwing a house party. You just uh, want to clean it up before the bad people show up. Exactly. And so the idea that what they were looking for is no paints they were putting on was preventing this. So they needed a coating that would essentially allow you to very easily clean this coking off before it would activate with the metal underneath and allow the machine to rust, basically. Exactly. You nailed it. And, and so System X is born as the coating that allows you to do all of that. Exactly right. Um, now, the helicopter, the particular vehicle... Um, is no longer made, uh, so the coating is no longer necessary, and our relationship with Sikorsky kind of went by the by the wayside. Andrew had more important things on his mind Clearly. at the time, um, but it's it's funny you ask because we're starting to come full circle now. Uh, we are now as a company going back after some military applications. Um, we've already created a number of new coatings. Um, I'm sure our competitors are going to love to hear this. You know, the, the the best ones in the market, and now we're going to be uh, making coatings for for our uh, our our fighting forces. It's uh you know it's it's definitely a feather in our cap. Absolutely, and I mean not not that you need my help marketing, but think about the idea of marketing the thing that you can use to make your car work. The same thing our military uses to help make their products work. Not 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 a bad marketing message. Right. So, so let's kind of pivot. So you, so you guys started in sort of that military application. And then the thought process was, hey, if I can do coatings for helicopters in adverse conditions, people like to keep their cars looking nice. Here's an opportunity to do the same. And that's just basically it's as simple as that. It is just as simple as that. Um, and I don't think this is before my time. I, you know, I'm less than two years with the company now. Um, I don't think Andrew truly understood what he was getting himself into. Uh, he thought, I will create these coatings. A few people will buy them. They'll use them. They'll make some money. What he didn't realize was that he, he was essentially going to change lives. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman who just did uh, a video for us. I, I don't think we've put it up on uh, Facebook yet or anything, but he, he lives in Vermont. Um, he was a car detailer. He started by detailing cars on his mother's front lawn. He would have friends, acquaintances, bring the car over to the house. He would vacuum it out, get all the dirt out. Um, he was learning a little bit about paint correction. Uh, and then the last step is he would usually put some sort of carnauba wax. 
on the vehicle. Now, Carnuba Wax is a really good product. I mean, it looks pretty good. Is Pro- that like normal? Is that is that different than I mean? Like, I always think of when I was growing up, we'd like put like the turtle wax, and it's a brand. That's name. Carnuba Wax. It's, it's exactly. Carnuba is like a type of wax. Is that? It is. It, it's a and and it's um, completely organic. It comes from a specific plant that secretes the wax. Ah. Um, and people started to use it on different things just to to protect things. And then somebody figured out at one point, we can put this on cars. And if the car is clean and the car looks good, this will keep it looking good for a month, maybe two months, a mm-hmm. couple car washes. And then you got to do the whole process again. Well, when Andrew created this coating that essentially it, it – it just protects the car for a lifetime now. You never have to wash your car again, never have to go through a car wash ever again. People started flocking to car detailers like the guy in Vermont. He was doing this on his on the lawn of his mom's house. He discovered our product within a year. He had bought a he had bought a permanent location where people could bring the cars. And then he was making so much money that he bought a house. He bought a Ford F-250, um, and now he's in the process of opening a second location in Framingham, Massachusetts, another car detailing location. He's literally, the guy was almost in tears when he was telling us the story because he says, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was in my 20s. I I now know exactly what I want to do. The only question is how, bil- how big can I build how this business, right? And He's not alone. Um, we have active accounts in the United States, about 3,000. So we're thinking we've changed about 3,000 lives so far, and we're still going. Yeah, well, actually, not to, uh, again, help you with your marketing. You guys are doing a great job for sure, doubling sales every year. But it's not just the 3,000 people that own that company, right? It's all the people that work for them, their families. It's a, it's a, huge, uh, it's a huge impact. So how does it work? Like, what is it about the coding that allows it to have a lifetime. I mean, I just like, that's wild, right? I mean, you're sitting here for those of us that used to wax our cars uh, in high school. We know the pain of like, oh my God, please don't rain for the month of June because if it's going to rain, I got to wax this thing again, right? So, um, so, so I remember all those days. So a lifetime warranty, that's, I mean, that's, a bold, that's a bold statement. Like, how does it not get washed off? Like, I, I just don't get it. So essentially, if you think about, um, you go on a a beach any place in the United States, right? You're going to see a bunch of sand. All that sand is is just silicon dioxide, right? Silica. Okay. Um, I mean, I just learned something, but go ahead. If you melt that down and you use um, a a catalyst like a flux, um, people in the Middle Ages figured out that they could melt it down under very high temperature, um, add a catalyst, and what would come out was this smooth stuff. All you had to do is just shape it. And essentially that was the start of glass. This is very, very similar. This is a glass-like substance still made out of silicon dioxide. We have additives, um, specialty things that we put in there to make the covalent bonds even better. Um, We like to say covalent bonds, strongest bonds uh, nature knows, right? Except for love. (laughs) Um, But essentially... Using the same sort of chemistry, but kind of on steroids, silicon dioxide creating a ceramic glass-like structure that just can't be penetrated. And it's much, much harder than glass, and it certainly, it's, it becomes semi-malleable. So in other words, it'll, it'll take an impact, and it'll, it'll unshape a little bit and then bounce back, whereas glass, of course, it takes an impact and it shatters. That doesn't happen with ceramic coatings. I'm like mind blown right now. So, so, and then, and then all that goes into a, a bottle I can like spray on a car. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's like unbelievable actually. So the, we've got one sitting on the table right in front of us. It's called our renew product. This, anybody can buy it. You can buy it right. on our website. Open the box. Oh yeah, absolutely. You'll see a little eight ounce bottle in there. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it from our, our website. This is the consumer grade product. It has a little bit, um, it's broken down a little bit more. So it goes on very, very easy. This product will last anywhere from six to nine to 12 months on your car. Keep it looking absolutely perfect. Um, The products that we have for our professional installers, much harder to put on. They have to qualify. We have to put them through a process so that they, they learn how to do it. 
right? Um, that will, our, our Max product, MAX, will last a lifetime. That's unbelievable. So, so, it, so it actually bonds with the paint? It bonds with the paint, but it also bonds with uh, the clear coat of the car, too, which is essentially a polyurethane. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does is it, it fills in the cracks. Um, so it's, it's like you have a valley, and you put a bunch of water into the valley, and it fills up so it doesn't look like you see the valley anymore. Now, let that valley essentially turn into an impregnable solid, and that's what you have with an SiO2 coating. That's just unbelievable. And that's why when you put it on your car, essentially like the water just beads and rolls, rolls right off. And that's the same. So why doesn't the dirt stick to the ceramic coating like it would to the polyurethane or, or the paint underneath? Because it can't find any surface sites. It, it needs imperfections to stick to. So dirt, <sighs> dirt will stick to itself. Let's say, let's say you drive through a mud puddle. Whether you have the coating on or not, um, something will get up on the car and the dirt will stick to itself. So there might be this kind of coating of dirt, you know, that when it dries, it's like concrete on the front of your car. If there's no coating on your car, you're going to be kind of scraping it off, um, using some sort of a, a, a soap. Um, but if it's and already... It comes off uneven and then it, there's like... They, sometimes it's like residue left behind. Exactly, or some sort of discoloration. Yep. Um, if there's a ceramic coating on there, you take a garden hose, um, not high pressure, just kind of hold it over your car, all that just falls away. Because it, it has nothing to adhere to. It just adheres to itself, and it just peels off like a, like a banana. It's unbelievable. And why doesn't the water wash off the coating itself? Like why, how can you guarantee the coating for a year? Like how are you so certain the coating is going to stay? Because the coating itself is not water soluble. Um, once, once it hardens, it's called the, the curing process. Once it cures, it's like when you take a, um, a ceramic mug and you put it in a kiln, it'll cure for a certain amount of time. Now it was clay. It was a whole bunch of different things. There's iron in it. But once once it's glazed and cured, no, it's glazed. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing really. It's why like the coffee it. in that cup or the water or the vodka, whatever we put in there for you. That's why it's not gonna vodka. <laughs> that's why it's never gonna absorb into it, right? Because once it's actually fired and all that, now it's like the water's not getting in there. This cup's waterproof, basically. Exactly. But now skip the kiln part. Skip the, skip the part where you have to get it up to high temperature. If you can have something that's ambient cured, in other words, doesn't really matter what, you have to be in a certain temperature range. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, not, can't, it can't be 50 degrees and it can't be, you know, 120 degrees out. But during typical ambient curing, um, it hardens every bit as hard as a kiln would, would harden a ceramic that you make a cup out of. That's amazing. And so we're doing this on cars. What I mean, I'm trying to think of other application boats, maybe. We do it on boats. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, there's there's a study out right now. Um, it's it's like a 30 year long study from one of our competitors. Uh, they put a first generation ceramic coating on ships to see if they could save a little bit of fuel. And it turns out there is a fuel savings. It may only be one tenth of one percent. But for one of these huge ships, I mean, one tenth of one percent fuel savings could be million or more dollars. Mm -hmm. So we're by the way, anyone who's ever operated a boat, even not that big of a boat, knows again, fuel is extremely expensive, and that bill comes back every time. Oh yeah, and there's there's fewer, there's not many um, less efficient ways to propel a vehicle <laughs> than with a, with a propeller. <laughs> So true. Does it, I mean, this is just a random question, but you know, the other part that you get from boats, especially like uh, in the ocean, less so in, in lakes, but you do get some of it in lakes is the, you get the, um, you know, in lakes more so than in the ocean, you sort of get that milk, like the algae kind of collection or in the ocean, you maybe get barnacles. Does it help at all with any of that, with the sort of the it, stuff that goes on the boat? It definitely does because it's so hydrophobic. Um, it basically hydrophobic. creates hydrophobic meaning, um, it water hates it. Okay. That's what, I, that's um, what it sounded like that word meant. Yep. But figured out. So it hydrophobic just means that if you put water on it, it'll just sheet right off. Um, because of that, uh, those, those small, um, 
little little creatures in the lake. And I don't want to get into too much detail, but I, I used to be a college professor as well. I, I taught night classes. For <laughs> what haven't years. you done, Mark? <laughs> it's, it's probably easier to tell you what I haven't done at this point. Um, one of my favorite courses that I taught was limnology, uh, which is the study of lakes. Oh. So um, there are little sea creatures called zooxanthellae. Uh, that are in lakes and in oceans. Um, they are members of the animal kingdom, and they love to stick to boats. Absolutely mm -hmm. love it. If you give them a surface site to adhere to, if they can only adhere to themselves, then maybe they can create a crust, but as soon as the boat starts moving, it's just going to move away from the hull. Wow. This is really uh, some impressive stuff. So I, I got to ask you the next question, though, because looking for the Achilles heel here. So the wax we talked about, we know why the problem with the wax. Constant reapplication. It actually does get washed off and all that. So what about um, environmental? Because, you know, the, the, the wax, as you mentioned, environmentally friendly, it's organic and, and all that stuff. This feels like a situation where sounds all great, but what kind of environmental damage are we, are we creating in, in terms of the making of this? So essentially, there is no environmental damage. It's everything that goes into the coating is used, or it's a carrier fluid that volatilizes, but not a lot of VOCs, volatile or organic compounds. Um, so very, very environmentally friendly. Um, as a matter of fact, once you have it on there and it's solid, it, it doesn't come off. It doesn't break down with water or acids. And essentially, it stops you from having to use sh harsh chemicals to wash your car. So in that way, it's Actually. more environmentally friendly. I, I hate to go, you know, full circle on you there, but it does create a, a better situation. So, and you guys have what, like, 40,000, 60,000 square feet in the manufacturing facility here? We do. So we have our, our warehousing and in, in manufacturing are all done in Thomaston, Connecticut. Um, the, the owner of the company, very, very big on Connecticut, grew up in Connecticut. One of my first questions I asked him when I joined the company is, would you consider moving to another state that may be more business friendly? And he said, no, absolutely not. I said, good. Now I know the rules. We're in Connecticut and we're here to stay. Um, so yeah, all the manufacturing and warehousing and shipping and receiving all in Thomaston, Connecticut. And just about a year and a half ago, we opened up a brand new office, 10,000 square feet in Cheshire, Connecticut. That's where our sales staff and support staff is. Oh, and me too. And yeah, and you too. Um, so, you know, that's really exciting. I mean, the company, we, we sort of talked about what it was maybe 10 or so years ago was sort of the first product launch, but outside of Andrew, I don't think there was a second employee until like 2017. Is that right? That is absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're talking and we're what, almost three dozen employees now? Yeah. Um, when I joined about two years ago, there was 14 employees. We, uh, let's see, this coming Tuesday, we're going to start our 34th. So more than doubled. And Andrew likes to tell me stories about when he had, there was there was a little mezzanine in the warehouse. He, he just had one bay of this building and he had a mezzanine where his office was and he was trying to do um, new coatings, and he was also doing all the sales, invited some people in to try to help him do some sales. Literally such a small office that if you had to get up to go to the restroom, you had to tell everybody because they had to scooch <laughs> in, you know, and suck their gut in so that you could get out, you know, get away from your desk. Right. We, we've graduated a little bit from there. Yeah, from there to uh, when I joined, we had 2,200 square feet of office space in Thomaston, one of my first jobs was to find us a new spot and build it out and get ready for expansion. And here we are. Right, right, right. So what's so what's the what's the future looking like for you guys? Three thousand more detailers. We would like to do that, um, but the sky honestly is is the limit. Uh, probably three years ago, about half of our sales were international. Um, unfortunately, COVID took care of that. A lot of countries didn't fare as well from a business perspective as the United States did when COVID hit. Um, we lost a lot of customers. Uh, a lot of customers are now just starting to come back. So we're going back to our international sales and building our, our sales teams to sell internationally. Um, we do sell into 81 different countries, but 
that still leaves a few left to sell into, right? Yeah, it sure does. And then it's mostly through distribution. Is that is that kind of the go-to-market strategy? Or We do. What we try to do is we try to get a, a trusted player in the local market, whether it's Egypt or Kuwait, India, uh, Sri Lanka. Not Sri Lanka so much right now because of all the troubles they're going through. Um, but we find somebody who loves our product and is interested in, in being a distributor. That way we're sending the product to them and then they sell it to their teams all around all around the country or the region. And then when, when the customers there need support, they call the distributor, they call back to you guys. How does that? They uh, So the first line of defense is the distributor, uh, but we stand behind our product, so we will talk to anybody. And who does all the training? Because one of the things you said before that I sort of made note of was, you know, there's a lot of training. Because it seems to me like the product's great does a lot of amazing things, but you probably got to put it on the right way, right? I mean, it's not, I'm not saying we're, you know, building rocket ships, but you do have to put it on the right way. It's got to be cured. You probably got to clean the car first. I'm sure there's a, a step process. Do you guys train on all that? We do. Uh, so we'll we'll run training programs. Um, some of it is done remotely because some of it can be done remotely. Uh, we also have kind of our wanderer. Uh, his name's Steve Persia. He's all over the United States uh, talking to installers, making sure that they're doing a good job. He also does sales. Uh, he used to be a detailer. He had his own detail shop. When he came on board with us, sold his detail shop, loaded himself up uh, and his wife and his, I think it's four kids. It, sometimes sometimes you see the, uh, the Facebook post and it looks like 14 kids. <laughs> But um, he's all over the place uh, representing us and, and helping people with training. Um, as far as our, one of our biggest growth opportunities is aircraft. And we just signed up a gentleman who has a very interesting uh, proposition because he not only helps people uh, get trained to do corporate aircraft, uh, private aircraft, uh, but he also, because his class is certified, he actually gets them a lower rate on their insurance. It's actually amazing. It's a win-win situation. So those kind of partners really help us. Well, that's, that's, that just sounds awesome, Mark. Just sounds like the sky's the limit for you guys. Absolutely. I can't think of, uh, you know, whatever we do next is, is going to be big. Well, listen, man, we'll be following. Um, I really uh, look forward to it. It's a really, really awesome story, and I appreciate you coming on to tell it. You ready for some uh, rapid-fire round of questions? I think I am. All right. This one I actually know the answer to because of our uh, of our pre-conversation, but Red Sox or Yankees? Oh, you know it, Red Sox. My goal in life is to go to every single Major League Baseball stadium and see the Red Sox at that stadium. As a, that, is a, that is a wonderful target, and if the opportunity presents itself, Mark, I take a few of those trips for you, with you. Uh, Starbucks or Dunkin'? Oh, Dunkin', easy. Staycation or exotic destination? Exotic all the way. There we go. Sports car or SUV? SUV. I got I to gotta get out and do my stuff, especially <laughs> in the winter around here. Ski bums got to have that SUV, right? We do. We do. iPhone or Android? I'm iPhone, but I'm, I'm noncommittal. If you had to do something other than be CEO or COO, excuse me, of Element 119, what would you do with your life? I always wanted to be a pro uh, baseball player. Uh, it, it, it looked like that for a little while. I, th I thought maybe it was going to be a possibility. Um, but a good buddy of mine, we both knew that we were never going to be pro baseball players. And we made a pact that at some point we were going to become umpires, go to umpiring school. So I would love to be a baseball umpire. No kidding. Dude, that's actually a legitimate opportunity. I hadn't thought about that. It's a good, that's a really good call. By the way, what position would you have played? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a shortstop by trade. Um, my college coach lined everybody up and made us run sprints. And the two fastest people on the team, he moved us to the outfield. So that's when I became an outfielder. <laughs> I didn't know if I had just tanked. I could have stayed, could have stayed shortstop. a shortstop. Uh, do you have a favorite business book? I do. Um, I got to think, I just finished reading it about a month ago. Um, I actually think it's the first book by this author. His name is Byron Walker, and it's the Small Business Turnaround Plan. And it is astonishing. I don't, if anybody has read it, they know he, he just, he just talks about exactly how he turned his business around. And all the different things. And, and when you're reading the book, you start to think, 
wow, I'm not the only one in this. <laughs> Small business turnaround plan. I'm going to check it out. What's yep. the name of the author again? Uh, his name's Byron Walker. Byron Walker. Although I do have another really good business book. Uh, have you ever read Animal Farm by George Orwell? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It teaches you a lot about business. <laughs> it sure does. Uh, well, business is all about people. So uh, what's one thing that you learned early uh, in your life, or early in your career that you think has helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Um, I would say, honestly, just become a subject matter expert. The more things that you're an SME in, um, the more people are going to come to you the more times you're going to be able to show your wares and the more opportunities that are going to happen. I mean, opportunities are just simply when luck, you know, meets opportunity. Happens, right? Yeah. Dude, I could not agree with that more. And I know it's supposed to be rapid fire, but before I ask the next question, I just want to double down on that. Cause I think there's so many people that feel like what you should do is figure out the things you're not good at and keep on working those to try and become well-rounded or whatever that is. But to me, success is all about going really, really deep in one subject matter and just being really great in that one area. It seems like that's something you've seen in your career, in your life as well. Completely agreed. Yeah, man. Listen, what's one thing, Mark, that you learned later in your life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young Mark and he'd listen to you, have a real positive impact on his life? I would tell him, buy Google. <laughs> no. Um, I, I, honestly, um, learn from your mistakes. I know it sounds trite. Um, they're the best lessons you ever learn in life. Um, you, don't, you don't learn when you do it right the first time. You have to make mistakes. Don't be afraid of it. Just, just keep tackling more. Do you have any like technique that you use to learn from those mistakes? Since, I'm, since we're now going into <laughs> doubling down on, uh, on rapid fire questions. Um, so you have to kind of turn your mind off a little bit. Um, your, your first thing when you make a mistake, and everybody makes mistakes, nobody does everything perfect the first time. Um, if you turn your mind off and stop the embarrassment and just talk to people, it's just communicate, just ask questions, don't be embarrassed. Um, you'd be surprised how many people have the same question, they're just afraid to ask it. Dude. That was awesome. Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on. Exciting. We'll be tracking uh, Element 119 uh, in your journey and uh, look forward to having you on again down the line. All right. Thank you so much. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community and it would be impossible to do without all of you.